our officer remains in hospital and is in stable condition at this time. The suspect is also in stable condition in hospital. A Toronto police officer has been stabbed and the suspect shot by police in a violent altercation. It's the fourth Toronto police officer injured on the job in two weeks. Good evening. It happened outside of Tim Hortons near College in Lansdowne. The incident unfolding in front of shocked bystanders as well as the suspect's girlfriend, who you'll hear from in just a moment. CTV Sean Lee Thong is live at the scene at this hour with the very latest. Sean. Well, Michelle and Nason, police say that they were initially called to the Tim Hortons behind me for a person in distress. But then we spoke to the suspect's girlfriend who says that the police said they had a warrant out for his arrest. Anyways, their accounts differ, but we also did have some video that we were able to obtain, which shows the struggle. In this video obtained by CTV News, you can see a struggle on the ground of a parking lot. Two officers standing up, each drawing their weapons. The man they were struggling with standing on the other side of a silver Toyota Prius. During the brief standoff, one officer can be seen limping. While the woman in the light-colored pants looks on, the second officer appears to draw a taser. And then the man behind the car seems to raise his arm, holding what appears to be a shirt. It's unclear when the shots were fired, but moments later, the man collapses behind a car. It started when they both grabbed him, um, saying that they had a warrant for his arrest and that they were going to take him. That's kind of when everything started escalating. Francie Piera is the woman in the light-colored pants from the security video. She's the girlfriend of the man shot by police. I believe he stabbed the officer in the leg. I was so in shock myself, I didn't even, even hear when he got shot. I heard the, the taser go off. I didn't hear the gun even. Toronto Police confirming that their officer had indeed shot the man, while the officer who was stabbed was just 22 years old. Both were rushed to hospital. This is the fourth Toronto police officer injured in the past two weeks, which really underscores the inherent risks our officers confront daily while serving the community. The shooting happening around 1.30 this afternoon, police quickly closing off the intersection of College and Lansdowne. In the aftermath, large pools of blood could be seen in the parking lot in front of the Tim Hortons. Witnesses say they were stunned by the interaction. I went to the store and I saw, I heard some shots. Like, what were the shots like? Like gunshots. The Special Investigations Unit have invoked their mandate, taking over control of the investigation, as is the case any time there is injury or death involving an officer. And you can see the Toronto Police forensic truck in the background, as well as the SIU truck. The area has been closed off for some time and will be. Reporting live, I'm Sean Neathong. Michelle, send it back to you. Thank you, Sean. And as he mentioned, the province's Special Investigations Unit is on the scene. A spokesperson updated the media a short time ago. This is what she said about what is known at this point. The initial call came in about a person in crisis, and that was from a nearby residence. The person in crisis was located by police outside the Tim Hortons. There was uh, some type of struggle uh, with two officers that were on scene, and during that struggle, um, the man produced a, uh, a knife and uh, stabbed an officer. And that officer uh, shot the man, I believe, one time. Um, prior to that, there was also a conducted energy weapon that was deployed at least twice, um, and that was ineffective. Both the officer and the suspect remain in hospital at St. Michael's tonight, and that's where we find CTV's Janice Golden. Janice. Hi, Nathan. Yes, we're live outside St. Michael's Hospital right now where both the officer who was injured as well as the man who was shot were taken by an emergency run this afternoon. We are told they are currently in stable condition. Now, Sean did show you some video of the moments leading up to the actual incident. CTV News has also seen video of the moments afterward. However, we've decided not to show them to you because they are pretty gruesome. I can't tell you what I saw, however, namely an officer lying on his right side in a pool of blood Next to him, a man lies on his back. Officers approach with handcuffs, and he raises his hands and says, hang on, I've been shot. He's asked where and replies, in my chest. And then he goes on to say, it feels like I have a harpoon coming out of my back. A few feet away from the men, you can see a large knife in the parking lot. Now, police confirmed the young officer in this case, who is only 22, was stabbed in the leg. He's a new officer with less than a year on the job, but we are told he's very passionate about the career. The president of the Toronto Police Association tells CTV News that he is expected to make a full recovery and is currently with family in good spirits. But John Reed also had more to say about the attacks against police this week. I have had enough with what's going on in the city. This is the third officer we've had injured now in three days. We had a uniform officer punched in the face walking down the street a few days ago. Another officer 
with a broken leg, and now we have this. It has to stop. We need the public, and we need the leaders of, our, uh, of Canada, of the city, our councillors, everybody to come out and support the work that our men and women are doing each day. The violence has to stop. Thank you. Meanwhile, Mayor Olivia Chow tweeted this afternoon, I wish the injured officer a quick recovery. This week, three Toronto police officers were injured doing their duties. One assaulted walking down the street. Another hurt intervening in a car theft. And now this troubling incident. Violence is never acceptable. Again, both the suspect and the police officer are considered uh, to be in stable condition and are expected to survive their injuries. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Nathan. Thank you, Janice. Amid one officer's injury, the trial of the man accused of murdering Constable Jeffrey Northrup continues. The defense calling its final witness today. What came out in court as the jury contemplates Umar Zamir's fate. More news in a moment, but first, here's a live look outside on this Friday night. It was another wet and windy day with a chance for more to kick off your weekend. Enough to warn a special weather statement. Jessica Smith is here with a look at the current conditions. Is it raining this hour? Very lightly, but it's the wind that's the bigger issue, Michelle, as we head into the end of our day today and the start of the day tomorrow. All this wind is prompting that special weather statement for gusts between 70 and 80 kilometers an hour tonight and into the start of the day tomorrow. As the bulk of the heavy rain pushes out, we see a trough behind it for lighter showers, but you couple that with all the wind and it makes for a pretty challenging evening. Again, we're looking at some pretty strong winds along the eastern shoreline of Lake Huron, for example, they could reach up to 90 kilometers an hour here in the city between 70 and 80. Wind direction, big issue out of the west, a little gusty right now, and temperature-wise, it's going to add a little bit of a freshness. We're still on the positive side, but the wind really not helping. Coming up, a full look at your long-range forecast right now. I'll send things back over to Michelle. Thank you, Jess. Still ahead on CTV News at 6, why the province is resisting calls to mandate electric vehicle chargers in all new home builds. A teenage boy rushed to hospital in life-threatening condition after a shooting in the city's northwest is now expected to survive. Toronto police say the 16-year-old was found with gunshot wounds near Jane and Shepherd just before 11 last night. His injuries are still considered serious. Police are searching for four male suspects. Anybody with information is asked to contact detectives or crime stoppers. Umar Zamir says he had no idea they were police. And today, the Toronto police officer who responded to the scene of Constable Jeffrey Northrup's death testified about what Zamir said in the moments following his arrest. CTV's Mike Walker brings us the latest from court. The defense calling its final witness, Detective Constable Ryan D'Souza, who arrived on scene after Constable Jeffrey Northrup was run over in the underground parking garage. D'Souza described seeing Zamir on his knees handcuffed with a glazed look on his face and damage to the major crime unit van. D'Souza said after reading Zamir his legal rights, he asked him what happened and that Zamir described he learned of a stabbing and wanted to leave. He said he saw a black van and a male and female get out. He said the male and female were hitting the window on the door. D'Souza, who was part of the major crime unit, told the jury while referring to his notes. He said that he was scared and was trying to get away. He said that he had no idea that they were police. He said that he saw the male approach his car and reach into his pocket. But again, he said that he didn't know they were police adding that Zamir said had he known they were police, he wouldn't have gone. He said it didn't say police like it did on mine, gesturing to the vest I was wearing. I then asked, you didn't see they had badges? The male replied, no, I didn't see anything. The jury also heard for the second time from Constable Charnel Pei, who has testified he told Zamir he ran over his partner and admitted to punching him in the face when Zamir struggled to get up from the ground while handcuffed. Pei also told the jury that Zamir said to him that he didn't know they were police. This week, Zamir gave emotional testimony from the stand where he apologized to Northrup's family, stating he wasn't aware Northrup and his partner, who were plain clothes, were police. He believed his family was being robbed and that he believed he drove over a speed bump when he attempted to get away. Officers have previously testified that they did identify themselves as police. The Crown alleges Amir chose to make a series of maneuvers with his vehicle, causing the veteran officer's death. This was the final day of evidence. Lawyers are expected to make their closing arguments on Tuesday. Mike Walker, CTV News, Toronto. 
As demonstrations continue in Toronto related to the Israel-Hamas war, Toronto police have charged a man with a public act of hatred. On Sunday, members of Toronto's Jewish community gathered at Nathan Phillips Square to mark six months since Hamas's October 7th attacks on Israel. Police say a man arrived at the square and allegedly made anti-Semitic statements towards children and demonstrators. 45-year-old Razali Awan Baadur of Toronto was charged with public incitement of hatred and failure to comply with a probation order. A suspect is now in custody after a deadly stabbing in North York early Saturday morning. Emergency crews were called to a plaza near Bathurst and Wilson at around 6.15 to reports of an altercation between two men. Police say 51-year-old Jolly Ann was stabbed with an edged weapon and died at the scene. Yesterday, police arrested 67-year-old Alfonso Corpuz of Toronto on a charge of second-degree murder. And Durham Regional Police say they've made an arrest after a noxious substance was sprayed in a movie theater last month. On March 24th, police say two suspects entered a screening at Cineplex Odeon Oshawa Cinemas and sprayed what's believed to have been pepper spray. Investigators identified a 17-year-old suspect who was brought to a police station by his parents and charged with mischief and administered noxious substance. The allegations have not been proven in court. A change is coming to the TTC and the way interactions are perceived. Riders can soon expect to see fair inspectors wearing body cameras, but not everyone is on board with the idea. CTV's Beth McDonnell joins us live with more. Beth. Michelle, it's a divisive issue, but in just a matter of weeks, some fair inspectors and special constables will have body-worn cameras, along with some special vehicles like the one you see behind me. They will also be equipped with cameras. Starting this spring, incidents on the TTC could be captured through a new lens, as the city's TTC board has approved the use of body-worn cameras, equipping 20 special constables and 20 fair inspectors. They certainly need more fair inspection, so I, I guess if, if they need to do that, they should do it. They'll only bother people who skip the fair, presumably. I don't see what kind of danger they would be in, so it is what it is to me. But at the end of the day, I really don't see a point. 14 special constable vehicles will also have cameras in and on their cars. The TTC says it came up with the policy after a 2017 Ombudsman report recommended car cameras to increase transparency. There is already video surveillance on the transit system and through consultation, the TTC says it found benefits giving body-worn cameras to staff. What our CTV cameras don't show is the audio. And now with body-worn cameras and in-car camera systems, we're able to capture that. So actually it becomes even greater transparency than we have currently. The TTC says while the nine-month program is a pilot costing more than $1.2 million and will be reviewed after nine months, it already has the funds to carry the program forward. Some groups are voicing concern, everything from people experiencing homelessness and mental health issues becoming targets, to whether racism and discrimination will play a role when a fair is checked, to when the cameras will get turned on and off. It's not a prevention tool. It is a clean up the mess after it's happened tool. And that's not where we should be putting our resources and our time and our money. So the presence of body-worn cameras will inevitably and by design capture people in their worst moments, which contributes to the, to the systemic over-surveillance of homeless people. The TTC says concerns are valid because people are aware of the cameras from police. With its policy dictating a camera must go on at the start of an interaction to notify the customer and is only turned off when an interaction has ended. It says footage is managed independently of staff with cameras and it's auditing interactions to see if people are overrepresented. So we want to be able to also check ourselves and use that information to say, how can we do better in terms of um, delivering our services? So it's really about accountability. Fair inspectors and special constables will start using the body-worn cameras in May. The TTC says the cameras will rotate among staff every six weeks. Reporting live at Davisville Station, I'm Beth McDonnell. Now back to Michelle and Nathan. Thank you, Beth. As the federal government works to move Canadians toward electric vehicles, the provincial government is resisting calls to mandate EV chargers in new home builds. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris has the story. 
and just plug it in. It's the most convenient way to power up an electric vehicle, a charger right where you park at home for the night. But the government won't require builders to include those chargers in new homes. If you want to get an EV, we encourage you to do that. Uh, but that's a cost that you will bear. That is not a cost that all Ontarians will bear on your behalf. EV chargers for new construction were baked into the building code until 2019. But since then, the government's invested $28 billion in the electric vehicle supply chain in cities like St. Thomas and Windsor. The largest battery plant uh, in North America is going to create thousands and thousands of jobs. With that in mind, he's making a really short-sighted decision. One that Marit Stiles worries falls in a pattern that could jeopardize Ontario's chance at being a global EV leader. Ripped up all the EV infrastructure, cancelled the EV rebates. Uh, right now, I'd say he's kind of letting down a lot of workers in Oakville by being missing in action. Ford Motor Company announced last week there would be layoffs at its Oakville plant, with the ramp up of EV production there being delayed by two years. An at home charger can cost thousands of dollars to buy and install after the fact, so Style says there's money to be saved. That's going to be cheaper now and much easier than having to make the switch later on and retrofitting all of those, of those buildings. The housing minister leaves it all up to personal choice. I'm an Italian kid. Uh, and every Italian, uh, when I was growing up, we wanted to have a, a, a stove in the garage because we did a lot of cooking in the garage. I didn't expect the builder to do it. We just paid for it ourselves. All of this is in the context of Canada phasing out new gas-powered vehicles by 2035. It's a policy that federal conservative leader Pierre Polyev, who's polling 20 points over the Liberals, has made clear he doesn't like. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Just days before the federal budget, the prime minister was in Vaughan unveiling what's being called a national housing plan. Justin Trudeau says it will build more homes, make it easier to rent, and provide assistance to those who can't afford to buy a home. CTV's Annie Bergeron Oliver reports. Liberal cabinet ministers fanned out across the country to pitch their plan to tackle the housing crisis. 28 pages of promises the government calls the most comprehensive and ambitious housing plan ever. It builds on the sizable investments we've made over the years and it goes a lot further. It's a plan to build housing, including for renters, on a scale not seen in generations among the new promises, Ottawa is giving tax breaks to developers who build rental units and to colleges who build new student housing, offering $40,000 in low-interest loans to homeowners who build a rental suite, spending $150 million to grow the number of tradespeople and offering more than $1 billion to reduce homelessness. No one thing by itself is going to solve the housing crisis, but this is a really good first step by the federal government, and we're starting to do things at a serious speed and a serious scale that hasn't been done in the past. To restore affordability by 2030, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says an extra 3.5 million homes need to be built. This plan aims to create a total of 3.9 million by 2031. But getting there requires the provinces to buy in. I'd like to know how they're getting that number, uh, you know, what, uh, what is involved there. Uh, and then just more about timelines, because as you mentioned, uh, you know, it's questionable how quickly these can come into effect. <sighs> One area where some say is lacking is a plan to increase the supply of new homes for purchase, and that, housing experts say, could push up the cost of new homes. Most of the money, most of the programming is designed to create more rentals in Canada, which is definitely a benefit to Canadians, there's no question. But it should also be understood just how little is designed to create more new homes for Canadians to buy. The government is also promising a historic shift in how public lands are used to build homes. It's also pledging to make it easier to build new rental units near colleges and public transit, an idea the Conservative leader has been pushing. Annie Bergeron-Oliver, CTV News, Ottawa. The public inquiry into foreign interference wrapped up today with a second appearance by the head of CSIS. The Canadian spy agency says it knows China interfered in both the 2019 and 2021 federal elections. But this morning, Vigneault said he agreed with top bureaucrats who insist the meddling did not affect the integrity of the vote. The director was called back in part to clarify whether information contained in CSIS briefing notes was conveyed to the federal government. At one point, Vigneault 
uh, was asked if the prime minister was informed that Canada was slower than some allies to respond to the threat of foreign interference. In, in the process of briefing the prime minister and his team uh, and, and, and the clerk uh, on, on, in October, my point was not to cover uh, background information on foreign interference, was to dive right into those very specific cases. So um, I would not have, uh, have gone through these notes and, and cover something uh, uh, like Canada has been slower than our five eyes allies uh, or, or, or others because uh, these are statements that I had uh, made before in public and in, uh, in, uh, uh, in private or during uh, briefing to ministers. The director says much of the content in his briefing notes was not passed on to the PM or his office during meetings. That is because Vigneault did not focus on background information, instead talking about specific instances of possible foreign interference. Global Affairs is urging Canadians to avoid travel to Israel. Up until today, the message had been avoid all non-essential travel. Some other countries have also changed their travel advisories amid threats of an attack by Iran or its proxies on Israeli targets. Today, U.S. President Joe Biden reiterated his support for the Jewish state. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. Israeli forces are on high alert after an airstrike earlier this month on the Iranian embassy compound in Syria. A senior Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps commander and six other officers were killed. Israel did not claim responsibility, but Iran's supreme commander has vowed to respond. In Texas, a number of people were hurt when a stolen truck slammed into a public safety office today. Officials say it was an intentional act. Three people suffered critical injuries. Three others were seriously hurt. This happened in Brenham, a town located about 120 kilometers west of Houston. A suspect is in custody and police say there is no further threat. In B.C., an attempt to rescue a stranded whale is underway. The killer whale calf has been in a remote tidal lagoon near Zabalos for about three weeks. Efforts to persuade the two-year-old to swim back through a narrow channel have failed. The attempt to get her back into open water was launched because of favorable weather conditions. The rescue will involve corralling the orca into a shallow part of the lagoon. She'll then be fitted with a sling that will be used to hoist her onto a flatbed truck for transport to the ocean. Coming up on CTV News, a missing vulnerable man who traveled far from home found how York Regional Police, through Project Lifesaver, managed to track him down. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up, it's Feedback Friday. More viewers say they feel they deserve compensation for canceled airline flights. More people get caught in the advance fee loan scam. And when it comes to pet insurance, some viewers say they would never buy it, while others say it's saved the money. Feedback Friday is just ahead. And we are right in the swing of sneezing season. If you have allergies, this weekend is going to be a little challenging for you. We are high or very high in almost all of the ponds that will cause you a bit of a, a bit of distress heading into the weekend. Coming up, I'll have a full look at your long range forecast, including when we get a break from the rain and the sunshine returns and stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. We had a lot of reaction to our stories on advance fee loan scams and car rental companies in the U.S. not accepting Canadian car insurance. Viewers also weighed in on the value of pet insurance and compensation for passengers if an airline cancels your flight. Pat Foran joins us now with Feedback Friday. Pat. Thanks, Nathan and Michelle. When a couple missed two days of their seven-day vacation, they thought they would be entitled to compensation, but their claim was denied. And other viewers tell us they've also been refused payments for canceled or delayed flights. When Michelle and Victor Fraser went to Jamaica, their flight was canceled and delayed twice. They missed two days of their vacation and under passenger protection rules believe they would be compensated $1,000 each. I want them to give me back monetary value for my two days that I have missed. But WestJet denied their claim, saying the delays were caused by unscheduled maintenance for safety issues. Angela told us, my flight was canceled, no reason was given, and I missed two days of my vacation. I was also denied compensation. If your pet has a medical emergency, it can easily cost hundreds or even thousands of dollars. A recent survey by Consumer Reports found you may be better off setting money aside in a savings account rather than taking out a pet insurance policy. 
we decided to really was the best option for us just to pay it, uh, you know, out of pocket. But Lori told us our dog had several major surgeries and veterinary bills came to over $40,000. Pet insurance covered most of it. Cynthia Polano was in Florida and rented a car. When she arrived to pick it up, she was told she must pay an additional $562 for car insurance, even though she has rental coverage through her own policy. He claimed that they were no longer accepting Canadian car insurance anymore. Brandon wrote, a rental company denied my Canadian insurance, so I refused the car. I was told some rental companies are taking advantage of tourists. Zach Brin wanted to get a loan and found a company online which said he was approved for $50,000. He was told he had to pay in advance for processing fees, currency conversion and insurance. He never got the loan and was scammed out of more than $9,000. They just went ghost mode on me. I did not hear anything back. John told us an online company said I qualified for a $40,000 loan. I paid them $6,000 in advance fees and the loan never happened. And according to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre, Canadians lost $3.5 million to loan scams last year. You should never have to pay in advance to secure a loan. And if you're asked to, chances are it's a scam. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. All right, talking weather now. Looking forward to this weekend. Hopefully this rain clears. It's a little bit annoying how the weather works sometimes <laughs> because earlier in the week, it was looking like it was going to be a pretty decent weekend. Maybe that the rain would stop by this point, but now it's persisting. It's kind yeah. of frustrating. The the Texas low, it, it's a serious one. It comes with a lot of moisture, and it, the bulk of it has moved out, but the tail end, that's what's trickling. That's what's kind of hanging on as we kind of round out the week. But more than that, it's the wind that is the issue as we head into the day. So although the rain is much lighter now, it's still very breezy out there. So that's what's prompting some of the issues into the end of our week. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Rain was a little heavier early on this morning. It's let up a little bit but it's still very windy outside the good news in all this and there is a little bit of good news at least it's kind of mild out there we're at 10 right now through windsor eight here in the city 11 through ottawa three in sudbury one in moosini we're relatively warm all things considered tonight just above that seasonal mark still a few lingering showers but really it's more of a wind event than anything else and getting into the day tomorrow a little more of the same but it comes with some midday sunshine so we do get a break finally from all the rain and the gloominess. Uh, temperature wise right on par for seasonal almost across the board. A little cooler but not by much through Owen Sound, Perry Sound and out through Aurelia, Bancroft and Kingston. The bulk of this low really pushes into Quebec again late today into the day tomorrow. The troughs, those extended lines, those little blue dots, those ones are what we're watching out for. That's what's still bringing some of the rain that we have as we round out the day today. Getting through the overnight, the early evening, not so bad. The blues in there, that does signify snow. But for us, because it is still relatively mild, falling as a wet snow, if anything, so don't let it uh, overwhelm you. We're not looking at any kind of major snow event for the GTA areas. A little further north could see more light snowfall but to be honest a lot of it melts throughout the weekend saturday is a little cloudy but into the afternoon there's that sunshine the cloud cover finally pushes out and it makes for a beautiful day on saturday getting into sunday we do have some morning showers leaving the risk of some thunderstorms but they move out as we get through about 10 a.m and into the afternoon we see some cloud cover and then a little late day sunshine pretty seasonal to start off the weekend warmer though through the evening sunday warmer still at 15 and then as that shower activity really dries up, heading into the end of the day on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, 16, 17, a whole lot of sunshine out there. Beautiful for spending some time outside. So midweek shower activity, very light in nature though, 15 on your Wednesday. And then getting in towards the end of the week, sunny, seasonal, and fantastic. So for all the gardeners out there, the rain, hopefully doing what it needs to do. I'll send things back over to Michelle and Nathan. Also tonight, startling numbers from a new report. Almost one third of middle and high school students have tried e-cigarettes and many of them become addicted. We clear the air about school age vaping. The Princess Margaret Home Lottery Early Bird Prize deadline is midnight tonight. It is $2.6 million, includes this gorgeous lakefront Muskoka cottage, $100,000 cash. I'm Taylor Kay. I'm here with Ramona Oss, who is 
Vice President Lottery for the Princess Margaret Cancer Foundation. Let's talk about where the money goes with the Cancer well, Foundation. Well, the money from the Home Lottery really fuels cancer research at the Princess Margaret, one of the top five cancer research centers in the world. So you know when you're buying a ticket, you have a chance to win incredible prizes, but also uh, helping a great cause. And of course, this is not the only prize. There are many more. Many, many more. In fact, over 20,000 prizes. Our leading prize, of course, is our $7.3 million grand prize, which includes a King City show home, a Jaguar I-Pace, and half a million dollars cash. Or how about a $3.3 million grand prize, which includes a show home in Blue Mountain and $100,000 cash. We've also got a home in Prince Edward County. We are making multi-millionaires. Plus cars. there's cars, there's cash, there's fabulous vacation prizes. Yes. Bali, where else? Bali, Maldives. Iceland, Croatia. Is Hawaii in there? Hawaii, Hawaii, Hawaii is in there. Absolutely in and there. You don't want to miss this amazing prize. Again, the early bird prize deadline is midnight tonight. Talk about this amazing cottage. The cottage is fabulous. Lakefront, you can make tons and tons of memories, but I don't want to forget about cash. So yes, you can win this cottage, but what about adding on a 50-50? Let's do it. Where are we okay. at with the 50-50? We are over 6.3 million dollars. Imagine what you could do with 6.3 million dollars or half uh, of 6.3 million because that's what the winner will take away and the jackpot is growing. Thanks to all of you we've already reached 6.3 million. We are 80 percent sold or over 80 percent sold so you need Amazing. to get your ticket tonight. Again the early bird prize deadline is midnight tonight. Get your tickets you don't want to miss out. Canada has one of the highest rates of e-cigarette use in the world. And researchers say addictions are affecting even school-aged users. Our health reporter Pauline Chan has more. Adolescent medicine specialist Dr. Trish Tullock works with both sick kids and CAMH. And when it comes to vaping, she says addiction sometimes begins before middle school. Specifically nicotine in this case. Um, we've seen young people as, yo as young as 10, uh, 10, 11. Recent stats show almost 30% of middle and high school students have tried e-cigarettes, with 8% reporting vaping daily. And while the minimum age to purchase vaping products ranges from 18 to 21 across Canada, Canada, Dr. Tullock says it's not hard for younger kids to get access. Typically, most of the access is related to the peers that the young person would be associated with. So it might be an older peer, for example. Young people are accessing vaping devices. They're accessing higher concentrations of nicotine. Um, so I know we discussed the fact that there, is, there are regulations, but they find a way. She says not only is addiction associated with mental health problems, but the nicotine itself and other chemicals in the vaping cartridges can cause harms to the body, especially of a very young person. The maximum nicotine content in vaping products is 20 milligrams per milliliter, but unregulated products often contain higher concentrations and vaping delivers higher concentrations than conventional cigarettes. I really like to see that, it, that all adolescents are being asked in every setting. And I realize, and, and we all recognize how tricky that is, depending on what the setting is, depending on um, the provider and, and trying to ensure that we are doing our best to ensure confidentiality is maintained. Dr. Tullock says adolescent kids should be asked about vaping in all health care settings and given information about the risks of vaping. One problem is the shortage of medical specialists trained to deal with school age addictions. But she says in addition to behavioral therapies to treat addiction, nicotine replacement therapies should also be offered. Pauline Chan, CTV News. As it recovers from last year's devastating cyber attack, the Toronto Public Library is sharing some good news and a request. The library said this week its online operations and all 100 branches are almost entirely back to business as usual after the severe disruptions caused by the attack in late October. With circulation back in full swing, the library asked borrowers to bring back any items they may have held on to while services were offline. The $1 fine for not picking up a reserved hold comes back on Monday. 
Pearson Airport will be getting a multi-billion dollar makeover. The initiative has been dubbed the Pearson Lift Program. It's aimed at modernizing and updating the airport. High-speed taxi lanes and upgraded control systems are included in the plans. There will also be investments in power generation to help Pearson achieve net zero targets. The Greater Toronto Airports Authority says the initiative will span more than a decade and generate billions in economic benefits. If you're taking the GO train in or out of the city this weekend, there are some service disruptions to warn you about. Barrie trains won't be running to Union Station to accommodate signal work. Instead, they'll operate on a limited schedule between Allendale Waterfront and Rutherford GO. Replacement buses will connect to TTC service at Highway 407. And on the Stouffville line, there will be no train service on Saturday or Sunday. Replacement buses to Union will serve stops outside the TTC service area. Here in town, riders along Line 2 will once again have to deal with an 11 p.m. closure tonight and no service all weekend along a central stretch of stations. St. George to Woodbine shuttle buses will operate. Stars on Ice returns. This time, Kurt Browning is directing as opposed to skating, and he'll carve out some time for us as he'll be giving away some tickets as well. CP24 Breakfast, where Toronto gets its everything every morning. Started when they both grabbed him, um, saying that they had a warrant for his arrest and that they were going to take him. That's kind of when everything started escalating. Updating our top stories, a Toronto police officer is in hospital after being stabbed. His alleged attacker also in hospital after being shot by police. The province's special investigation unit is now on scene, probing the minutes leading up to the altercation. Witness testimony is wrapped up at the Umar Zamir trial. The last witness, an officer who attended the scene, who confirmed that Zamir claimed he was unaware that the people approaching his vehicle were police officers. Closing arguments are expected to begin next week. Increasing the presence of enforcement, um, we'll see also an increase in troubles um, that's prevalent in law enforcement across the country. And TTC riders have mixed reaction about fare inspectors being outfitted with body-worn cameras. The TTC board approved a nine-month pilot project for inspectors and special constables to wear the cameras. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you happen to have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. Stock markets fell today amid fears of an escalation of violence in the Middle East. Andrew Bell of BNM Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Investors sought shelter in bonds and they sold shares today on reports that Israel was preparing for a possible attack from Iran and or its proxies. That follows an Israeli attack at the start of the month that killed Iranian commanders in Syria. U.S. stocks dropped about 1.5% and Toronto was down almost 1%. Markets were also hurt this week by diminished expectations of U.S. interest rate cuts as inflation stays high. Gold hit record highs today above $2,400 U.S. an ounce as some investors sought a hedge against losses. On the markets, the Canadian dollar traded at 72.59 U.S. cents, down a fraction. WTI Oil, North America's benchmark crude, was at $85.08, up 63 cents. Western Canadian Select changed hands at $70.53 a barrel U.S. for the Alberta benchmark crude, down 35 cents. And the TSX Composite ended at 21,899.99, down just over 210 points. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. The Business Report is brought to you by Canadian Western Bank, the bank built for business. As artificial intelligence companies compete to offer more polished chatbots, OpenAI is promising some tune-ups for ChatGPT. Paid subscribers can now access the newest version of the software that powers those automatically generated responses. OpenAI, OpenAI rather, says GPT-4 Turbo is measurably better at writing, math, logical reasoning, and coding. And when asked to compose written content, it will be more direct, less verbose, and use more conversational language. And another tech-related story that's getting some buzz tonight. More changes are coming to the blue checkmark system on X, formerly known as Twitter. 
Owner Elon Musk previously took the checks away from verified users and made them a subscriber-only feature while offering alternatives to governments and official agencies. Recently, they've been appearing on some prominent profiles, whether users request them or not. The Verge now reports people who tried to hide those check marks will no longer have the option to do so. Streaming company Roku says more than half a million customer accounts have been affected in a data breach. This marks the second time Roku has had to make that type of announcement in recent weeks. Although the first breach only impacted around 15,000 users. This time around, Roku says malicious actors got into those accounts and were able to make unauthorized purchases in less than 400 cases. The company says sensitive information was not shared and it will refund anyone affected while requiring password reset. A federal judge has ordered Shohei Otani's former interpreter released on $25,000 bond, but he must also undergo gambling addiction treatment. Ipe Mutsuhara is accused of stealing $16 million from the L.A. Dodgers superstar over several years. He's charged with one count of bank fraud and faces up to 30 years in prison if convicted. Mitsuhara made his first court appearance today. At the Masters, much better playing conditions today for round two. List Wolves Corey Connors is the top Canadian. He's at two over for the tournament and looking to make the cut after finishing his round today. Right now, Bryson DeChambeau is in a three way tie at the top of the leaderboard with Max Homa and Scotty Scheffler. And the Raptors are in Miami tonight for their second last game of the season. Dennis, spin dribble, Claxton, power move into five. Toronto's lost two straight and sits 12th in the Eastern Conference. The Heat are a game and a half back of Philadelphia for the East's seventh seed. The Raptors and Miami play again in Florida on Sunday. This year, and Cal Raleigh sends the first pitch to deep right and into the Seattle pen. At Rogers Center, the Blue Jays open a three-game set with the Colorado Rockies tonight. Toronto lost the final game of their series against Seattle, but managed to take two or three games. This evening, Kevin Gosman will be on the mound against Colorado's Ryan Feltner. Meanwhile, Yeriel Rodriguez is expected to make his debut with the Jays sometime this weekend. The Cuban right-hander signed a five-year, $32 million deal in January. Rodriguez played in Japan from 2020 to 2022, but sat out last season due to a disagreement with the team. Tonight, the unusual attraction drawing a crowd in New Brunswick. <laughs> Llama walks on a sandy stretch of beach, bringing a unique experience to town. That story and more later on CTV National News. And a reminder, the CTV News at 6 podcast is available as a download every weeknight. And we say bonsoir to those of you listening to the newscast live on News Talk 1010. Hi, Toronto. I'm Teddy Wilson. And I'm Nicole Servinas. Welcome to Things to Know T.O. Each week, this show shines a spotlight on a wide variety of local businesses, services, events, and initiatives from across the greater Toronto area. These companies are part of what makes Toronto one of the world's most vibrant cities and a great place to live, work, and play. Join us every week on Saturday mornings for Things to Know T.O. And don't forget to visit our website, thingstoknowto.ca, to check out all of our great content. It is unknown whether ancient artists knew that dinosaurs existed, but a recent study published in the journal Scientific Reports reveals prehistoric humans in Brazil would intentionally carve rock drawings next to dinosaur footprints. One researcher says the marks might have been left during communal gatherings, and it is possible the early humans mistook the prints for that of native birds. Mm must wonder about that. What about that forecast? Wind. wind. <laughs> so much wind. The thing is, is that we're done with the bulk of the really heavy shower activity, but you can see from the shot that was behind us, it is really breezy outside. So just take care. If you have any, I know people are bringing out those potted plants. We're getting ready for spring. We're in it, you know, but maybe bring them inside for tonight. We're looking at wind warnings along the eastern shoreline of Lake Huron. For us here in the city, those uh, weather statements are for 70 to 80K guests. It is still quite mild, and as we head into the rest of our weekend, it's not so bad, guys. We get sunny breaks both afternoons and we stay at or above seasonal. 
Thank you, Jessica. That's it for us, but be sure to join Heather Butts tonight at 11 for CDB National News, followed by Natalie Johnson with your next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Jessica Smith and all of us here at CTV News, thanks for watching and have a great weekend.